Hi everyone, here's the Bookchemist once again. Today I'm reviewing Foucault's Pendulum, Il Pendolo di Foucault by Umberto Eco, a book that I cannot really fully express how much I loved. It's very difficult for me to convey the full sense of how astonishing a reading experience this was. And already it seems to me that very often these videos I filmed are just me mumbling nonsense about novels that I enjoyed very much. So today I'm going to begin by giving you a few reasons why you you shouldn't read Foucault's Pendulum, some of the things you should know before you decide to tackle this thing, uh, because this is definitely not a book for everyone, and it's not a matter of, you know, it's a difficult book, so you need to be a good enough reader, whatever that is, it has nothing to do with that, it's just that because of its nature, it's not going to be to anyone's taste, and if for whatever reason you do not like Foucault's Pendulum, or decide to try it, and cannot enjoy it, know that you are in good company. So many people cannot really stomach Echo's fiction. Uh, in Italy in particular, he has so many detractors, and some of them are, uh, you know, do not like him for political reasons, but some of them do not like him for pretty literary ones. First thing you should know about Foucault's Pendulum, as about the rest of Echo's fiction, at least the part that I know, uh, is that uh, this novel, Echo's fiction in general, is very much told fiction. When it comes to that opposition in writing between showing and telling, that is usually theorized in American writing classes, uh, you know, you can describe a scene or you can set it, you can say things such as, it was a rainy day, you are telling people that it was a rainy day, or you can say things such as, uh, the rain hit the sidewalks and the fields, you are showing them what's happening. Uh, American writing tends to favor the showing uh, over telling so that uh, much American writing from the 20th and 21st century is written in that mode. You, uh, an extreme case of that come, uh, can be found in the fiction of people such as Hemingway or Raymond Carver. These people who tell, uh, basically give you scenes of things happening in the life of characters and sometimes it's difficult to fully grasp the emotional implications of a scene because you are not told anything about what's happening but you have to reconstruct it from what you are seeing this Foucault's Pendulum stands at the opposite end of the spectrum. This is a novel with a very vocal narrator, who is also the main character, who repeatedly tells you throughout the reading why the story he is telling you is important, he characterizes, you, characterizes scenes and characters, he tells you what is going to happen, or at least he hints at something ominous that is going to happen once he has told his story, he keeps foreshadowing events and uh, referring to the implications of the act of telling, and that is not to any, any to everyone's taste. As mentioned, American writing classes usually warn students against telling, uh, but it's something I personally love in fiction. That's the reason why I love so much writers such as Eco or Lovecraft or Borges. These writers who spend the first paragraphs of whatever they write telling you why what they're writing is important and what terrible things will happen once they're done telling their story. I love all that stuff, all that, all that type of decoration, all that type of narrative, of experiencing a narrative and a story. It may not necessarily be for you. Uh, another thing in, very important to know about Echo is that most of his fiction, most of the story and most of Foucault's Pendulum, which, make no mistake, it is action-packed, oh my god, it has such a beautiful action-packed plot, but most of it is made of dialogue. This is very much a book that is, all the time it is people talking to other people and discussing uh, obscure historical moments or uh, certain historical mysteries or some, some uh, personal theories they have about the nature of stupidity, about the publishing world, about whatever, through dialogue. This is uh, one, uh, maybe not 100% but 90% dialogue. And I think it was Elmore Leonard genius author of uh, crime thrillers, who said that it is possible to write fiction entirely through dialogue, and that I do believe is 100% genius uh, when you manage to pull that off as Echo does, but be aware that that's the kind of book you're getting yourself into. Also, as you can see, this is a hefty tome, but it is a 700-page novel, but be aware it feels much, much longer. That's because it's made so extensively, as mentioned, of 
dialogue and these dialogues uh, uh, they tend to go into the minutiae of historical passages and to detail certain historical moments or certain uh, conspiracy theories certain uh, crazy um, um, uh, uh, bits of mysticism and uh, the story of alchemy and all um, all sorts of impossible crazy things and they tend to discuss them in great detail this is something that also happens with the name of the rose il nome della rosa and it is my main problem with that book that at times it's a little bit too far up its own ass and please keep in mind that The Name of the Rose is one of my very very favorite novels of all times and I liked Foucault's Pendulum even more mostly because the, names, the Name of the Rose deals extensively with the minutiae of medieval politics and the history of the Catholic Church which is not necessarily to anyone's interest whereas the various stuff discussed in Foucault's Pendulum that most mostly revolve around the world of occultism and around some obscure historical moments, the Knights of the Temple, the Rosicrucians, um, the occult history of the 19th and 20th century. These things tend to be a little bit more interesting and I do believe that most of you uh, will find them a little bit more stimulating, even just because they're surrounded by such a fascinating and charming aura of mystery. That fact, the fact that Echo writes in such detail about all of these historical moments and things, comes, I believe, from the fact that he was first and foremost a scholar and a professor. Uh, I've read other books by professors and many of them uh, have the, that, that same fault. Um, and another thing that I believe does come from his being a professor is that sometimes he overestimates the level of erudition of his audience and what I'm trying to say is that I completely missed many cultural references in this novel. Uh, I did, I could reconstruct them uh, I could reconstruct the meaning even from stuff I couldn't grasp because as Echo himself actually teaches us in The Role of the Reader, you reconstruct a book uh, as you are reading it and you build your experience of it as you're reading it and even the things you do not really understand tells, tell you that you should understand them in a certain way. This is uh, complex semiotics uh, that I myself do not necessarily understand 100% even though I should. What I'm trying to say is, especially if you're not Italian, because this uh, uh, references extensively Italian history and literature and popular culture from the 70s and 80s, especially if you're not, you are, many of the references in this uh, thing are going to fly over your head. Many of them uh, flew over mine. Uh, you have to be cool with that. I hope I didn't scare you away from reading Foucault's Pendulum because uh, none of these things is actually scary. It's just stuff that is not to anyone's taste. Uh, it's a bit like describing a novel by talking about its genre. It, it's nothing good or bad, it's just, you know, some people do not like certain genres for whatever reason. Uh, if you're on the fence about reading Foucault's Pendulum, my suggestion is go through and carry on uh, through the first three parts. Because you know that telling I keep, I, 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 I mentioned at the beginning of the video, the, the first two parts of the book are 100% telling. It's just the narrator giving the book its flavor and setting the stage and uh, foreshadowing certain events and talking about the plot in obscure ways and there's this lengthy description of a church in France filled with bizarre technology that is quintessentially echoish. Eco eco Ikoish. He has this taste for uh, arcane lists and orgiastic scenes of all sorts. Um, but uh, once you get to part three, to Bina, uh, the, you, you start getting some meat around the bones, the narrative bones of the whole thing, and things start getting interesting. If by the time you've reached Hazard you are still not convinced, consider dropping the book because the rest of it is more of the same uh, throughout its entire length. If you are hooked, what follows is more of the same solid gold and more of the same amazing narrative characterization. And in Foucault's Pendulum, I do believe possibly the greatest thing is that Eco's gift as a historian emerges, both in the way he characterizes the past, medieval history, modern history, and manages to, to make you see why people from such past ages with such different mindsets from ours behaved in the way they did and how they approached the world. And at the same time, he manages to draw beautiful connections with the contemporary world and to show you the relevance of these remote ages 
and the way basic human matters have not changed that much throughout history. He characterizes Italian cultural life beautifully and he portrays the pretentiousness of part of the Italian intelligentsia uh, and he characterizes different uh, people from northern Italy, uh, people from Piedmont, from Piemonte, uh, as different from people from Milan and he gives all of these characters amazing flavor. There's some unfor unforgettable characters in years. There's Diota Levi, the guy who believes he is Jewish even though he has no proof and he is in love with math and uses math as religion or maybe uses religion as a form of math and he is one of the most unforgettable characters I've ever read. I loved him so much. There's Allié in this book which is also has other names and he is a bit of a Charles Dexter Ward if you know your Lovecraft. Uh, it, he is very much Eco's version of that character and he is one of the most uh, astonishing achievements in this novel because he is a, in many ways, a viscid, a, a sleazy guy. He is really a nasty character, but at the same time he is very fascinating and other characters remark on this repeatedly. And it was only after I'd finished the book, after I'd reflected about it for uh, some time, that I realized that yes, I despised Allie, I despised this character, but at the same time many of his reflections were actually rather charming. And at several points while I was reading this book, I was actually kind of buying into some of his theories, which is horrible, because the point of the book, possibly the key point, I think, of Foucault's Pendulum, is showing you the, um, the pervasiveness of conspiracy theories, the pervasiveness of the way people build these alternate histories and believe in all sorts of lies, be them political, be them um, mystical, be them religious uh, in, in some ways, because they, need, they have a need for grander narratives and they do not, uh, they cannot accept the beauty and the truth of basic things and they have to look for further truths to justify the horrible nature of most of the world. That's what makes Focal's Pendulum such a powerful experience and such a relevant read. It shows you the persuasiveness of certain worldviews and the way they adapt to all things and the way people who are convinced of their conspiracy theories and certain worldviews will not stop at anything, will not notice the truth, will interpret silences and denials as further proofs of their systems. It shows you the pervasiveness of ignorance, basically. This is very much a very long, very complex and very upsetting study of ignorance as opposed to madness, as opposed to stupidity and a couple other things. Um, and make no mistake, this makes it sound rather depressing and it is powerful, but I do not think it is depressing. As an act of telling, as an act of writing, it is very liberating, it is very brave, even though it deals with a, a co-main protagonist uh, who is characterized throughout his life as having lost his chance at being brave, but I'm getting a little bit too uh, deep into uh, the plot of the novel, so I'll stop. I do need to remark though on the fact that this, for all that it sounds hefty, is actually a breeze to read if you're the right kind of reader, not as in it flows fast, because as mentioned it's actually rather slow as a read, but it's always so enjoyable and all of these historical passages are so fascinating and uh, all of these conspiracy theories because they're so fucking persuasive, are also rather enjoyable to read, even though they lead to horrible worldviews and to people believing in the most disturbing shit. Uh, and also it's hilarious, there's so much irony in here, and the description of the Milan intellectual scene, once again, is beautiful and totally hilarious and side-splitting. Uh, the, the way it talks about digital humanities, about the way computers revolutionized um, humanist pursuits. This is something many people, I believe, do not reflect upon a lot. But uh, if you work in the humanities, until a few decades ago, there were people who spent years of their lives, scholars of literature, of art, who spent years of their lives 
cataloging books and looking for how many times a certain word emerged in a specific text. And now there's software, there's programs who can do that in a fraction of a second. But is that, is that type of process, is that type of research, research the same as a research that involves taking several years and immersing yourself deep into a text? Is the result all that matters or is the process of getting there important? All of this stuff is so fascinating and these are just some of the topics that are touched in Foucault's Pendulum. I finished reading it a week ago, so I need, definitely need more time to elaborate my reading experience, but at the moment this has really definitely become one of my very favorite books of all times. I, I, I loved it so much. One final thing I forgot to mention when talking about reasons why you may wish not to read Foucault's Pendulum uh, is that I, uh, it's something some people have remarked upon, uh, which is that Foucault's Pendulum is in many, many ways very similar to Umberto Eco's last novel, Numero Zero. Uh, usually I do not care much about that stuff, about similarities in plot and setting. Um, you know, novels are about, yes, the plot and the characters, but also the, the style, the language, the voice, the focalization. So it's uh, even when novels share the same plot or are rewritings of the same story, it's actually very easy for them to feel very different. Case in point, uh, The Great Gatsby and uh, The Mysteries of Pittsburgh by Michael Chabon. Uh, but at the same time, uh, it is true that the two novels, Foucault's Pendulum and Numero Zero, do share so many elements. They're both set in the publishing world in Milan, although um, Pen Foucault's Pendulum mostly deals with vanity, um, uh, with vanity publishing, whereas Numero Zero deals with bad journalism. Uh, they both deal with some obscure moments in history and with people who are obsessed with conspiracy theories and with ominous plots that may or may not be true and that emerge from these obsessions. Uh, I do believe that they are different enough books to each be a masterpiece in its own right. I did love Numero Zero a lot and I can't wait to reread that one too, but they are similar. Uh, what I probably want to say is do not read these books too close to one another maybe, uh, which is also good because since they're so good you can spread them uh, throughout time and take some time between one and the next. That said, if all the things I've mentioned haven't scared you off, you're going to have a hell of a great time, I'm positive, with Foucault's Pendulum. Do let me know, please, in the comments below if you share my enthusiasm. I know that some people regard it as Eco's best novel, and I can't wait to discuss it with other people who loved it as much as I did. And thank you, as always, for watching, guys. In a second on the screen, you'll find links to my review of Name of the Rose and Numero Zero by Eco. Check them out if you're interested, and I will see you in the next video. Bye, guys.